Hello everyone and welcome to today's THE and D2L webinar, Creating the Universities of the Future Today, Entering the Next Phase of Digital Transformation. My name is Ashton Wenborn and I'm the Special Projects Deputy Editor at THE. I'm delighted today to be joined by an expert panel from academia and industry. So allow me to introduce first Tim McIntyre Batty, Deputy Vice Chancellor at Bournemouth University. Tim, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Tim. Uh, I'm at Bournemouth University. It's a, it's a comprehensive, you know, mid to large size university in the south of England. Uh, and our purpose is to inspire learning and advance knowledge and enrich society. So uh, I'm delighted to be able to be with colleagues today to discuss what universities of the future might look like. Thanks, Ashton. Thanks, Tim. Uh, we've also got Jason Lars, who is Dean of Students at the University College Dublin. Hi everybody. Um, so it's a, it's an honour to be asked to participate in this panel. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how diverse or concordant our views are as the topics and questions um, uh, go along. We've only actually met each other through a recent technical briefing, so I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, yeah, UCD is a, a, a mid to large uh, size university. It's the largest in an Irish context, about 33,000 students. And uh, we've recently been through a transition um, in terms of our BLE, uh, and that's led to my participation in this. Thank you. We've got Jonathan Eaton, who is Academic Registrar at Teesside University. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here and to join uh, this panel. Teesside University has around 18,000 students. We're based predominantly in Middlesbrough in the northeast of England. Our student body is uh, made up predominantly of commuter students from across the Tees Valley and the Northeast, but we have growing numbers of international students and also students drawn from the rest of the UK as well. I'm looking forward to discuss our digital transformation programme and how that's been impacted by the pandemic and some of our thinking for the future as well. Thank you. Thanks. And then finally, we have Stuart Watts, who's Vice President of EMEA at D2L. Yeah, hi Ashton, thanks for that and thank you to, to our panel for joining us today. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I work for a company called D2L, uh, we're a Canadian uh, software vendor and providers of the LMS solution Brightspace. And I suppose today um, I bring a bit, a bit more of a technology slant to the conversation uh, in terms of how technology should be supporting the university of the future. Thank you, thank you all for joining us today to the panel and also um, everyone who's attending. In the wake of COVID-19, digital tools have shifted from being something that many universities were thinking about implementing, but few had acted on in a meaningful way, to being something, to being the only way that teaching could occur. Institutions have now had almost a year to adjust, so they have to consider how to future-proof this new digital offering. So I think to start the conversation today, it's important to look at why simply shifting old models of teaching and learning online isn't enough. Uh, Jonathan, I know that Teesside has been a leader in adapting to tech-enabled learning long before the pandemic hit. So what's your view on how we can effectively move online? Thanks, Ashton. Our digital transformation programme started several years ago, around 2016, and we took a, a number of critical steps that I think have been fundamental in how we've responded to the pandemic. We introduced a learner analytics platform uh, which perhaps I'll talk about a bit more later on, which has allowed us to monitor the engagements of students with their learning, regardless of where and when they're uh, learning uh, as part of their degree courses. We also introduced one of the largest one-to-one -one device deployment programmes uh, within the UK, higher education sector, and equipping our full-time undergraduates and teaching staff with iPads and keyboards. And we began in 2018 to roll out a mandatory digital development programme uh, for all of our teaching staff. All of that meant we were uh, relatively well positioned when the pandemic began to emerge. But I think the critical thing with, with all of this is to emphasize that although we introduced uh, a training program, which was mandatory, we view innovation as an output of that. So our focus is, has been on providing staff and students with tools and the capability to use those tools, but then to allow staff and students to experiment and innovate according to the specific needs of their disciplines. And I think that's 
what has been so exciting to see how innovation has solved problems that we didn't actually know existed before the pandemic. And the challenge we now face really is how to mainstream some of that and to understand what will add value beyond uh, the duration of the pandemic. And actually, what are the elements of more traditional forms of higher education that will retain their value and in fact that our students might be longing for in reality. So I think this has all been around really um, a step change of unprecedented proportions in how universities adopt technologies. But I think the way that universities have done that and will continue to do so directly reflects the context in which they're working. And I'd be uh, really interested to see what my fellow panel members uh, see from their perspectives. And if anyone else in the panel, you know, what have your experiences been in terms of quite quickly adjusting and then you know, taking a different look at this is something that's really going to be a permanent part of education moving forwards. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, similarly to Jonathan, I mean, we had switched, we had made a decision to switch, you know, uh, the virtual learning environment or whatever you want to call it, you know, because people put different labels on these things, um, you know, some years ago, and we were looking for something quite different. Um, and we were looking for something that I think had more affinity with the student body and the way in which they engage with social media platforms um, uh, and something that perhaps looked, looked something that was more familiar to them. So, so that was something that we had in mind when we, when we were making the shift and deciding to make the shift. Um, the other part of the project, critical part of the, of the project when, when we started shifting, which was about four years ago, five years ago, we were specifying four, year, four years ago, really, in terms of procuring and actually starting to embed the system we're about three three and a half years in was um was thinking very much about how how staff use the system so it's a little bit um you know as jonathan was saying you know it was interesting to him talking about um you know mandatory it's really interesting talking about mandatory training for staff um we we've been down the route of um you know not not talking about mandatory training but more just supporting sort of innovation and enhancement, you know, within disciplines for staff and sort of thinking about where they, where they might want to go. But it was driven by, I think, you know, the current situation, but previously a view that actually we could support staff, you know, perhaps to do less content and course management uh, and, and less sort of course administration via, via, via a sort of a, a managed or virtual learning environment and more into innovative practice and thinking more about their pedagogy and their practice. And so we spent quite a lot of time thinking about what sort of system would facilitate that. And hence we sort of landed where we where we are. I mean, the, the current situation has meant obviously that although we, we've rolled this, we rolled the system out and we, I think most people were relatively familiar with it. Of course, that sort of learning and development and support has needed to be accelerated. And I think it's brought, you know, a, you know many benefits and also, a, you know, a, a number of downsides in people having to make such a rapid shift but I think part of the part of the story for me, and I think for our community, and I suspect for many communities going forward, is, is to think about um, what is kept and what is left behind. And when I say that, I don't mean just about the immediate experience, but but I mean the experience previously. So you know, I think we've moved from a place generally from talking about getting back to how it was, to actually talking about you know things being being quite different. And I could say more about, you know, the report that underpins perhaps why some of us are here, Universities of the Future, which I think was an interesting exercise for those that participated in terms of, you know, forcing them to think about what, what Universities of the Future might look like. But I think the fact that um, tech enabled was the phrase that Jonathan used. I think the fact that we don't want to be tech enabled, I think we want to be more than that. Um, I think I think we want to talk about digital pedagog digital blended pedagogies or fused pedagogies, uh, and we want to talk about what type of student and staff experience, you know, actually works well under these sorts of conditions. But actually, post pandemic, what have we learned? So I think we need to capture the you know the best parts of what's happened. Leave the then there are some bad parts of it. Leave the worst parts of it behind. Um, you know, because there's a, there's a there's a cost and a burden to to a learning curve, to a steep learning curve, um, and also consider you know legacy practice that we had before, keep the best parts of that, 
but perhaps reconsider what really were the best parts of that legacy practice, of that best practice. Uh, We've actually got a question here, and I will just direct uh, the audience as well to the Q&A function that we've got in, in the webinar today, uh, Tim, about uh, what VLE you've moved to um, and, you know, how, how, how that's influenced, I guess, the way that you intend to move forward. We, we, we moved to Brightspace, actually. So a number of the conversations that we had in, during the procurement exercise were actually were with Stuart and his team in terms of thinking about the functionality, uh, where, where perhaps their development was going. And, and Stuart and I sort of talk regularly about the things that might be coming you know, down the pipeline in terms of functionality for the system uh, and uses for the system and how it can best support you know, the practice that we have in the university. And so much like Jonathan, it sounds like we might be a, a, you know, a little bit further behind Jonathan in terms of the student analytics but I've been you know, very keen to, to, to support staff with innovation, but also very keen to support student analytics, but from a student's point of view. So you know, we can look at student patterns of behavior and we can think we understand what that means. And I know a lot of the work that's been done in the UK from JISC and others has been about effectively um, tutors and institutions reviewing student patterns of behavior which is all fine and right and proper. And if we can put in good adjustments to catch students early withdrawal or to stop them uh, you know, early withdrawal, that's brilliant and so on and so forth. And I have, you know, I think that is one of the uses. I'm, I'm quite keen that students actually get to look at that data and compare themselves with their cohorts and see, you know, actually how much am I engaging compared to, to, compared to my colleagues? Perhaps, you know, I ought to reflect about, you know, the nature of my engagement with this learning material that my tutors have provided and whether I'm spending enough time on that. And so, so I think there's, there's a lot more to come. But yeah, we, 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 we moved to Bright, Bright Space with Stuart and his team at D2L. Yeah, and you raise an interesting point in terms of the fact that um, these, um, these tools are going to be used by both uh, staff and students. And I suppose if we're looking to quite radically rethinking uh, pedagogy, um, you know, how do we build in the fact that, that this doesn't just have one end user in mind? Um, I, Jason, I don't know if that's something that you've considered. Yeah, maybe just to give it a little bit of context first, the, um, the transition in, uh, in UCD happens um, 2018, 2019, uh, which is really very proximal. Uh, to when the pandemic hit. Uh, I, I like the, uh, the use of the term mandatory, uh, which is not, not a word that is in our vocabulary, um, uh, but it was tempting all the same. In terms of training, um, we had uh, something like 1,300 different individuals uh, turn up for kind of training in, 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 in the new LMS, and that was Brightspace, we were united by that. Uh, um, and, you know, there are all sorts of other more advanced training that was going on around assessment and grading and um, additional tools in Brightspace, um, universal design, which is really important uh, and become increasingly important um, from the pandemic point of view. Uh, and then, you know, uh, and we thought that was pretty good. <laughs> and then... Uh, and, and then it became uh, clear that even more training was necessary. Uh, and that's when a huge community of um, educational technologists uh, and um, IT services uh, specialists uh, and educators who had kind of um, advanced um, preparation in this domain really kicked in and started doing lots of things uh, locally, uh, supporting uh, the equivalent to departments in uh, trying to pivot from what was chiefly a face-to-face -face experience to what was an, an online experience. So I, I just think it's worth just referencing that all, all of that, I mean, I was involved in the transition project, but as a Dean of Students, I'm not the head of education for the university. Uh, so I became a, a, almost like a voyeur and I was kind of looking at what was happening uh, kind of th th through kind of um, through my hands almost uh, hoping that um, the, the, the products that we had purchased would stand up to the, uh, you know, the, the pandemic and, and the use. I mean, an extra 2 million logins, um, you know, in, in the year 2020 versus 2019, you know, an extraordinary weight on the system, uh, on the technology. 
Uh, and, uh, and thankfully, of course, it did stand up. And that's not to say that there aren't things that we're still learning how to use, but uh, just gratifying that it all worked out, uh, as you can imagine. But sorry, um, Ashton, I think you had a, a more specific question. Could you remind me? Yeah, so I was interested about, um, you know, if we're producing these technologies to be used by both staff and students, what are the different needs there? How do we address those needs to make sure that the learning experience um, and the teaching experience is, you know, a, a positive and effective one? Well, um, I mean, part of that is in the uh, initial kind of procurement exercise, making sure you've got technology that's fit for purpose. It, in, in our case, um, that meant making sure that students were involved in the discussion um, right from the beginning. Uh, that a survey went out to staff and students uh, looking at uh, what are best practices, what would they like to see. The user experience was extraordinarily important to the student and, uh, and the kind of having a kind of a clean interface that wasn't cluttered, wasn't layered, was really important as well. Uh, and it certainly delivers on that. But from the, uh, the, the other thing, I suppose, is of interest, and I think it's been mentioned by Tim as well, um, we really wanted to make sure that uh, we have technology that's capable of helping, helping the students reflect on their own progress. So kind of things like the, the, the progress bar is useful. Um, but, but actually, um, initially, you know, there were some concerns about um, how stressful it might be for the students to, to actually kind of see how they're doing in comparison to other people. Uh, so it would be interesting for us to monitor that over time to make sure that actually the things that we thought might be useful like that reflection, don't end up actually being counterintuitive. I'll, I'll, I'll just add to that, if I, if I may, um, Ashton, because I do, I do think that, you know, there's a lot of the responsibility lies with the tech vendors to, to really, you know, think about the different users, the different user journeys, whether it be academic, student, administrator. You know, that one thing that I don't think anybody can disagree with is that there's been a huge amount of change and a, and a big shift to blended, hybrid, fully online, whatever you, whatever you want to call it, and whatever guise your, your institution delivers it in. And so it's up to the tech vendors to ensure that we're helping with what is a massive upskilling project uh, on the academic side in particular making that as 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 easy as uh, as easy as possible and then obviously you know ultimately from d2l's perspective we're all about the student experience we're all about okay let's make it easy for academics to to give that experience but ultimately it all comes down to how good an experience and engaging an experience we can provide to students to 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 help them move towards um attainment so you know, it's it's been a to go back to the original question uh, around you know why shifting traditional you know models of teaching and learning online is is not sufficient. You know, good online. I think everybody has realised through the pandemic that good online learning looks very very different to good face to face learning, and and we're fortunate at D2L that we get to see the whole scale uh, across our customer base. You know, we, we work with the likes of Southern New Hampshire University uh, and Athabasca University, who are you know, famed for their fully online delivery. And, and we also see universities that have never done fully online delivery or have, you know, been, been predominantly focused on face-to-face. -face. So, you know, the, the, the content side of things is a huge, a huge task. You know, it requires different types of content to drive engagement. The design of the course structure uh, is completely different, uh, you know, to, you know, to, rec to, to provide the students with a flow and guide learner interactions from start to finish and, and that type of thing. So it's a whole new pedagogy um, that that's had to had to be learnt. And and I think, you know, we've seen a real mix of of universities that have dealt with this really, really well and, and really equipped academics with the the skills that they need to to move towards this. This I don't like this phrase. Everyone uses it, but new normal. Um, and, we, and we've seen, you know, universities that have struggled with it as well. But the, the good news is, I think, that there's been a recognition that simply delivering lectures online is not good enough. Um, and, you know, there's been this focus on, on moving forward. And, and potentially, you know, one of the positive aspects of this is that we can potentially start to offer better personalization. And if we look at the way that we can use analytics as well. There's, you know, there's a, a, a huge opportunity there to, um, to deliver better teaching. So I wonder, um, 
I guess specifically in terms of personalization, what can we do going forwards? Uh, Jonathan, you were nodding. I don't know if you wanted to speak on that. Thanks, Ashton. I, I think personalization is absolutely key for what the future of higher education looks like. And that theme came through very strongly in the University of the Future report that, that Tim referenced. I see uh, learner analytics is providing the foundation for effective personalization. We introduced a new learner analytics platform in September 2019. And what that did was to uh, basically expose to staff and students existing data on their engagement with learning. And, and it drew on things like attendance data, card swipes, use of printing, library activity, VLE usage. When the pandemic began to emerge, we then pivoted that model so that we were purely drawing on data streams for online learning. And what that allowed us to do was to understand at individual, at cohort, at school and institutional level, how our students' behaviour had shifted. So to give you a, you know, an example of that, a personal tutor in advance of a tutorial can look at a dashboard and see that uh, a student's behaviour online has changed from they were previously accessing the VLE throughout the week, but now they only go on the VLE on a Sunday afternoon. That opens up a coaching conversation to understand why that is. And that might be because the student is homeschooling all week and that's the window they have for their studies. And therefore, the support that we can put in place for those students is absolutely tailored. Now, now, Tim raised a really significant point around when we talk about analytics, it must not only be from the viewpoint of the institution, it's also about the student and what is in it for them. I think there's two elements to this. First of all, we increasingly live in a world where algorithms uh, dominate what we are shown and what's provided to us in terms of information, whether it's the TV programs that Netflix recommends, whether it's what Amazon suggests we order next. So it's increasingly becoming part of the expectation that students have. But on the other hand, we need to be very careful of concerns that people rightly have around how data is used. So we approach this from a perspective of radical transparency, which means that we worked with students to develop a code of practice based on the JISC model, which we've published on our website in terms of how we use learner analytics now and the parameters that we'll put on it uh, for the future. But we also opened up the platform to our students so that they see everything that staff see, whether it's the same data, the comparisons that are made against cohort and the notes that are made on individual meetings. What we're beginning to see from that is that in itself is driving student behaviour. It's, I suppose it's nudge theory. It's like a Fitbit for education that students are going online to see how have I engaged this week, this month with my learning? How does that compare to my peers and what can I do differently? Moving forward, I think the use of platforms forms like this will become increasingly sophisticated for universities but also I think become part of that almost operating methodology that students have in terms of how they recognize how their learning fits within their broader commitments and how they can optimize that to get the outcomes they want from their degree. Can I, can I, can I just follow on from that a little bit and also pick up on something Jason said it might, might be going in a slightly tangential or a different direction, Ashton. So apologies if that's the case. But 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 I think I mean just just think about the title of the session, you know, and it's you know entering the next phase of transformation, and and we're talking about analytics and, and student behaviour, but we're but we're always talking about it in 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 the sort of um, in the sort of digital domain as it, as it, as it is at the moment. But but I do think we have to look. We have to look beyond as well. And just picking up on Jason, I think, who talked about on online learning as opposed to as opposed to not online learning. And, and, I, and I do think there's an, you know, we, we've talked for years about blended. And, and I do think, you know, actually now is the time when we're really talking about blended, because actually largely when we've been talking about blended, we've been talking about legacy with little with little changes. And little incremental, you know, in some areas, you know, marginal, negligible, you know, changes and improvements. And there's nothing wrong with that at all, you know, because there's a lot of established best practice in learning theory and pedagogy. And there's a reason why, you know, universities have done things the way they've done things, you know, for many years. But also looking past, you know, pandemic conditions to the future, 
there's also a reason why now and in the past and in the future it, it's not it's not just about online learning and and, and it's I just caveat what I'm about to say by saying that I have three children and two of them have engaged heavily with the Open University. So, so, so one is now doing a PhD elsewhere, but did a lot of learning with the Open University and one is completing their degree with the Open University. And so I think, you know, like many things, there are market segments and there's a time and a place and perhaps a, you know, a base and a market segment for different types of learning. And the Open University is wonderful at what it does. And even my better half, you know, worked as a lecturer for the Open University on and off over the years. So, but, but, the, but not everybody registered with the Open University and there's a reason for that too. Um, and, I, and I think we have to remember, you know, it, it is about digital transformation. It is also about the sticky campus. If we go back to HEP Higher Education Policy Institute's report in 2017, uh, especially as, you know, we're often, but not always, we may have diverse cohorts of students, um, you know, for, and, and international students, but we are also serving our region. Uh, and often there's a very strong regional contingent in our universities who are not always living away from home. So we do have to think about, you know, the sticky campus and social and collaborative learning, you know, in the, in the future. Um, and, and, and I think it, you know, we are now really starting to talk about blended pedagogies and di blended digital pedagogies. Uh, and we realise just how difficult that is to understand, you know, what is going to be really effective. But we mustn't forget, you know, there's a reason why, you know, place is important. Uh, I mean, I happen to have gone corporate today and, and put up a picture of my university in, in the background with a, with a, with a flagship building and, and some green. Um, and there's a reason for that because, you know, I'm proud of, you know, Bournemouth University and I'm sure we all are proud of where we are. I just joined a, an EU funded project on leadership, leadership transformation with the European Universities Association. We haven't even started the project yet. And the first thing people did in our learning set group of, of eight institutions was sent around a picture of the, themselves on their campus, which was fascinating. So people are, there's something about place that is really important. And there's something about what, how we did, we did always used to do it in, in place and on campus. And, and we call it at Bournemouth, we call it a campus premium. There's something really important about that that's not to be forgotten in this, in this dialogue. Could, could, I, uh, could I also add, I know you've got probably lots of questions to get through Ashton, but I just, I, I, I feel that I must uh, commit uh, the following, which is that, um, uh, Tim talks about um, the importance of place, and, but, uh, but I think buried within that is also the importance of human interaction, real human interaction. And uh, what became apparent in the first wave of the pandemic was that the, the thing that our students missed the most was their interactions with each other. And they're not necessarily their interactions within a learning environment, but the interactions that happen outside of the learning environments, in the corridors, over coffee, you know, playing sports, uh, being involved in social activities. So it is really important to recognize that those are drivers of the student experience and therefore their over overall their educational success, uh, uh, as well as the place that they identify with, it's the people within the place yeah, I, 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 sorry, Ashton, just to quickly come in there. I, I totally agree with that as well. And you'd probably expect me as a, as a tech vendor to, to be talking about the importance of online learning. But actually, you know, I don't think anybody uh, is, is convinced that, you know, there is, there is a campus premium and that students will want to go back to campus. That's, that's definitely going to be the case. And certainly from, from my perspective at D2L, our job and our focus is really to just try and close the gap between the campus experience and the online experience. So many uh, universities, you know, when you look at their online experience, you don't get that same level of personalization that you do from the campus experience. And I think that technology has a big part to play. We focus very heavily on that at D2L in trying to replicate the sort of personalization that, that, you, that you get with that face-to-face -face, uh, learning experience. And, you know, there are, there are countless examples of, I, I, there's always one that springs to mind, which is Deakin University in Australia. 
um, who, you know, there's uh, a lady there that runs a very, very large psychology class of 2000 students and was really struggling to provide a level of personalization to a class that size. And, you know, through a combination of video feedback and also a, a, a tool that's unique to Brightspace actually called Intelligent Agents, which is a, uh, essentially a, um, an automated messaging service that's looking for uh, behaviors in the background and things that students or academics are doing and triggering personalized messages. You can use it for positive reinforcement or remedial content or whatever it might be, but it automates personalization at scale. Um, which is really, really important, I think, when, you know, you think that universities are going to have to think more and more about their online reputation and, and the service that they provide to students online. As, um, as around the world, we start to consider quite tentatively, I think, returning to campus um, in some places, we're obviously a lot further ahead than others. Um, are there how significantly will we be rethinking what those spaces are used for? A lecture hall is going to have the same, um, you know, place physically in the very center of a campus. Um, how will we continue letting clubs and societies meet? And, you know, those are really important um, places for, for students to develop the job ready skills that they're not necessarily getting in their courses. Uh, Jonathan, what is going to happen to campuses? Thanks Ashton. I think part of this echoes uh, Tim's comments around the importance of place that I think are, are really important, particularly for, for campuses that have a, a predominantly regional audience and a large number of commuter students. I think what the pandemic has done has really shone a light on the value of campus-based activities and the value of online activities. In other words, out of all of the activities that make up the student experience, which are best delivered online and which should be prioritised on campus. I think many of us probably on this webinar have had a shock over the last 12 months when we first realised the impact of social distancing on capacity within teaching spaces. And I think moving forward, resilience in teaching spaces will need to be uh, engineered into how campuses are designed and changed in the future so that we are mindful of um, how the impact of things like pandemics, climate change, et cetera, where we need to reduce the footprint of students on campus can be achieved. Wonky published a survey um, yesterday looking at the student experience under the pandemic. And one of the questions really struck me where it was asking students which activities they felt should continue online beyond the duration of the pandemic. What was really interesting was it, it seemed to me, and obviously that's one survey, it's one set of results, students were really appreciating the value of things like access to online support services, mental health, counselling, careers, etc. Also recognised the value of personal tutoring being delivered online and I could I could appreciate that for many students actually it might reduce anxiety about interacting with individual staff members where it's run online but there was also a demand for uh, collaborative, uh, collaborative facilities between students talking back to what Tim was saying where students can come together in ways that simply can't be replicated online and also questions on um, things like virtual labs virtual workshops which really on the basis of the technology we have at the moment don't replicate that authentic feeling of what uh, the university campus can offer so I think we'll really begin to see a greater stratification of which activities are best run online and which can take place physically on campus and recognising the importance of campus for the identity of students, alumni and staff. Yes, and I think the, the point about, um, you know, labs, I think medicine is a is a, a subject that is not necessarily always best suited to being online. So um, I suppose, Stuart, from a supplier side here, um, do you think that there are subjects that aren't best suited or are there are parts of of that kind of teaching and interaction that we can continue with going forward and then others that really do need to be campus based? 
But yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Uh, you know, there are certainly examples of uh, customers, you know, that are doing more online in certain departments and, and less online in other departments. I, I, I actually think that uh, the, the guys on the panel are probably best placed to, to, to answer that question, to be, to be perfectly honest. But be, before I kind of pass to, I think Jason uh, is, is going to come in on that one. Before I pass to that, I would, I would um, just add that, you know, things like flipping the classroom, which has been, you know, has been around for a while now and there's, there's plenty had a go at it. You know, that's the sort of thing that online can really help. And, and in terms of use of, of physical space in, in the, in, on the campus, you, people can start to flip the classroom more and then use the campus for sort of smaller tutorials so that students are doing more work online. We have a, a fantastic example of this from Huddersfield University. There's an engineering class uh, run at Huddersfield University where, you know, the, the class was sent um, the content ahead of time. They would, uh, they would do that content. They would then receive a survey from that content, which asked them, what did you understand and not understand? And then the experience would be personalized off the back of that survey. They were sent into peer groups to discuss the thing, the concepts that the, gr the group didn't understand as a whole. Um, sorry, in, in, if there were lots of sort of individual spreads of misunderstandings, they would split them into groups and, 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 and get them to do some peer work. But if there was, you know, something that came out of those surveys that was, um, you know, something across the entire group, then that would be the focus of the next tutorial and, and they would get together on site to do that. So there's some, there's some really good examples of how you can, you know, use online to help with the use of, of physical space on campus as well. Yeah, uh, so uh, thanks for the uh, uh, for the noble pass there, uh, Stuart. Um, I, I I suppose I just wanted to come in. You mentioned medicine, and um, I was previously um, the head of education within the School of Medicine before I um, became the uh, University Dean of Students, and uh, and I know there's quite a lot of people on this uh, webinar who'd be uh, from a, a medical surgical education background. Um, it's been really interesting to test what actually can be delivered through an online uh, medium versus um, what cannot. And the things that, I think generally speaking, the things that people previously said couldn't be delivered, generally speaking, there has been a way with some notable exceptions, including uh, patient uh, interactions at the bedside, which may take place online at the moment, but the learning experience in, in the wards is very different to that in, in an online environment. But quite a lot of the practicals, for example, some of them have been converted to online experiences, but that isn't to say that that's ideal. And uh, I, think, um, I think we've all reflected similarly. It might be a little early yet, uh, even with that analysis, that really helpful analysis from Jonathan, it's a little early yet to try and determine which of the experiences um, that have been trialed through the pandemic are actually going to be the ones uh, that that stay in a kind of a digital or online environment and which uh, will now revert to some form of face to face. Um, I, I think people need some time to heal. Um, it's been traumatic for everybody. Uh, and I think then that reflection will be quite powerful. Uh, the second thing I just wanted to mention was that I remember um, being involved in the construction of, a, of the new kind of health facility uh, uh, just from a kind of an academic point of view uh, trying to help determine what facilities would be needed back in 2005 and when I look back at the building that we constructed um, I kind of there are so many spaces that are still fit for purpose even even bearing in mind what we've been through but there are some spaces which I think are back to Jonathan's point relatively inflexible and I do think that resilience in 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 design uh, for the university of the future is really important being able to kind of build spaces which can be then rebuilt uh, and and converted into something a little bit more flexible uh, that's quite difficult for example than a tiered lecture theater uh, not not so bad if you've got a, a flat room you know those types of very simple things actually we d definitely need to reflect on uh, as we as we continue to develop our facilities I think, there's, I think there's something also, I'm just reflecting on Jason and Jonathan's comment, there's something also about what can be done, which is slightly different to what should be done. Um, so, and, 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 and although you can do certain, perhaps what we would normally have thought of being practice-based things, not through practice-based learning, um, maybe you shouldn't. 
um, and actually that's perhaps not what students want. Um, and, and in some instances, although we can do, and I know, you know, a number of us have been, you know, toying with this, you know, engineering or design, you know, not, not in a lab. Um, that's not necessarily the type of experience that students want. That's not necessarily giving them the full complement of skills and experiences that they will perhaps need in the, in the workplace or what employers are looking for. Um, and perhaps not helping them build their portfolio to be able effect effectively to showcase their talent to employers as well. So, so I think, you know, there is a debate about, you know, just because you can doesn't mean you should, you know, so it's slightly, 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 slightly more philosophical one. Um, and, and, and I think what we've probably found during this expert, you know, period of experimentation is that, you know, we focus certainly as university, I expect many others have on practice. Uh, we have a model called fusion, which is about bringing together education, research and practice uh, in, in every di in every discipline. And so we focused on, you know, on campus, what can we facilitate practically? You know, what does is that what students are, are looking for? You know, are staff able to do that effect effectively? Um, but, I, but I think just to, uh, you know, to go back to Jonathan's comment when you asked him the question about what does it mean? I actually think it's raised the bar for everything. Um, you know, I think, I think earlier people were saying, we understand now just how difficult it is to do good online learning well. Um, so I think that's, it's absolutely raised the bar in terms of what, what do digital resources, you know, what should digital resources look like? How should we create, curate them? How should we guide students through them? How do they engage with them? It's really up the bar there in terms of, you know, how students and staff navigate that space. Uh, you know, and have a journey through that space. But I think it's probably also really up the bar in terms of what we think should be on campus. So what, what should be on campus? You know, if, if, it, if it is a lecture, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the lecture. There's a reason it's established best practice. Um, is it a keynote? Is it, is it good enough to be called a keynote? Is it really absolutely inspirational? You know, or, or is that what we're going to be spending our time thinking about? making sure that you know those sorts of spaces are reserved for you know and you, just because it's a keynote doesn't mean it's not frequent but but but, but actually i think it's probably up, you know expectations for both on campus and off campus activity i think are probably higher than they've, they've ever been um you know and i think it's worth saying at this time both for now and in the future just how hard all our academic and professional services colleagues are working you know right across the board to try to bring this to bear to think about these things to think about the infrastructure to think about the learning journey and to think about their own development and being able to support themselves colleagues and students in you know in, in providing university experience I think a large part of the university experience that a lot of students have missed out on this year has also been partnerships with industry um, and so how important is that what role does that play in in equipping students for lifelong learning and and whatever they move on to after university as well i'm happy to kick off on that one i think i think it's incredibly important i mean i would say that partly because bournemouth university has a really high number of placement students traditionally uh, we often have you know we're often in the top three or the top five in the uk for the either the number or the proportion of students on placement and it just seems to be embedded in the institutional psyche you know somehow um, and, and we've worked at that, but, but, but it's just always been there. It's, uh, and it's always been incredibly strong. And, and one of the things we found, you know, currently is that of course that's, that's been threatened because, because a normal sort of placement year, sandwich year, you know, has been threatened, you know, how do, how do, how do people firstly acquire that? How long, you know, can they actually do 40 weeks or 30 weeks or is it, or is it less? Um, and, and that's been a real challenge. So, so I think that you know, there's a part of the student experience that I think has been lost, you know, in the immediate term, and we will be wanting to regain that as soon as possible. And so will students. Um, but we have been trying to sort of, you know, appropriately amend policies and procedures to support students on shorter placements, 15 weeks, 10 weeks, you know, trying to help them build those relationships, you know, perhaps for shorter periods of industrial placement and learning um, that, that's still relevant and can link to their programme. But, uh, you know, I think that has, been, that has been very awkward and I think is, has been a loss in this interim period that we need to sort of think very hard about how we're going to make sure 
on that aspect, we do get back to where we were absolutely because there's no doubt that was good for students. And we can see that in the data in terms of their graduate prospects, their career salaries, their contribution to society. Jason, did you want to speak on that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very big question. Um, the kind of the interplay with industry is increasingly important. Um, uh, and it, it's a related but slightly tangential point. The, uh, the importance of, uh, of the university in playing a role in career pivoting um, is becoming increasingly evident. Um, we have a national project looking at that, which I'm lucky enough to be involved in, which is looking at the role of micro-credentials. Um, it's looking at the, um, how do we partner and collaborate with industry uh, to develop short courses that are stackable uh, and of utility in helping people to move uh, from one type of role within their organization to another, um, or for those who are, aren't lucky enough to be in employment to actually uh, be able to gain employment again. That was incredibly important because um, the social consequences of not doing so are unspeakable. Uh, so I, I, th I think it's one of those opportunities to help universities uh, remain um, uh, relevant, uh, to remain um, kind of connected, and to do more than the traditional kind of um, CPD offerings, which uh, are often around graduate masters and graduate diplomas and those types of um, uh, courses. And actually, a lot of the time, something shorter and more flexible is really what's required. So I, I think that, that that conversation then also needs to permeate into the, the undergraduate experience uh, and what we learn uh, about the need for transversal skills, for example, the need for digital skills. That's what industry tell us that our graduates need to have those, those skills. We can then embed within the undergraduate curriculum. And, and many of the, much of this is actually technology enabled as well. So um, that's a, so it, it's, it's bifold and it's bi-directional. Um, in my view. Stuart, um, Jason mentioned micro-credentialing. Is that something that you've seen a, a large demand for? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and we, we're seeing it uh, more and more. Um, and, you know, from, from our perspective, we're seeing a, you know, a, a shift to universities and industry working closer together to create these stackable shorter courses um, that you know the world of work and employees need to dip in and dip out of to, to reskill. Um, so you know it's it's pretty commonplace within uh, any sort of RFP that we receive or, or comes across our desk these days to to want the support for this at least as a, a kind of future uh, a future thing to support micro credentialing um, certification badging and certification that type of thing. Uh, and indeed, you know, I think universities see it as an opportunity as well, um, you know, to, to offer this to the to the general public and to work with with um, businesses in and around the university. Uh, we've got we've got, you know, countless examples of uh, of customers that have a sort of shop front where they offer these shorter courses and sell them to um, to corporate partners or even to to the public as well. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're seeing a trend towards micro credentialing and it's certainly something that that we're focused on and, and that we support today. Yeah. Just one, just one more thought on that, a very quick one, is that I think, you know, alongside that, we can also think about the opportunities for people to actually engage in interdisciplinary learning at the mm. moment, perhaps to, perhaps to a greater extent than we have in the past. You know, with so much more curated content and material and, uh, you know, and thought gone into, you know, a, a digital enabled learning experience. What we've heard from some of our student groups is is a willingness to and a want to engage in other subjects and other disciplines now of course that wouldn't be necessarily credit bearing or count to their award but but there's absolutely no reason in a sense why more of what we do couldn't become more open learning across the university across our community so i think it that also you know following on from jason's comment opens up you know more opportunities for people you know as we know careers are are less easily defined these days, that people are more likely to switch jobs more frequently and to switch career track and even possibly discipline and the focus of, of their job. And so actually, you know, good interdisciplinary understanding and a good interdisciplinary grounding, you know, will support careers for the future and, you know, and, and allow people to actually think 
more easily about how they engage, you know, both in their discipline, career in their discipline, but perhaps a career elsewhere. There was a, a very good recent, I said it recent, before I did mention this to someone the other day, and I said it was pre-Christmas, but it was actually May last year report by, by, by the British Academy about, about, about this and about how um, uh, social sciences and humanities um, graduates, you know, seem to move across different paths in their careers and how that was different perhaps to other disciplines and, and valuable, uh, you know, but, but in it, but in it, but needed a different grounding from a social sciences and humanities or an interdisciplinary sort of view, which I thought, were, which I thought was fa fascinating. Um, and I do wonder sometimes that some of the things that we talk about and, and the way in which we do things do sort of ignore that need for that broader understanding of the world of work and careers and disciplines and how they relate to each other and how we respect each other's disciplines and understand how, in, you, know, you know, we work together, you know, a, a, across disciplinary boundaries most of the time in our working lives. Yeah, I totally agree with that as well, Tim. We're seeing that a lot. There's a lot of, of universities that are talking about inter interdisciplinary study and how technology can help facilitate that as well. So, yeah. Thank you all for that. Um, we've had a number of really interesting questions from the audience. So I would like to turn to those before we run out of time. Um, I think, first of all, something that I'm sure you are all thinking about is the issue of digital poverty. Um, we know that everyone doesn't have the same access to space, to technology, um, broadband speeds, etc. Um, Jonathan, how have you tackled that? What are we going to do moving forward if we expect to um, work in a in a blended way in the future? Thanks, Ashton. Um, and I think this is certainly the elephant in the room with everything that we've talked about so far. At the outset of this event, I talked about what we'd done already pre-pandemic. I think the pandemic shed a light on digital poverty and the scale of it that we hadn't anticipated up until that point in time, really from, from five aspects. First of all, in terms of hardware, but I think the majority of universities have addressed that in terms of providing devices to students to software. And Again, universities have worked collectively with tech providers to uh, make sure that students have access to the appropriate software. But then it becomes slightly more harder in terms of the challenges that we face. So equipping students with the necessary skills to operate and learn effectively online and not take it as an assumption that they know how to do things. Thinking about space, and this was a particular challenge for many of our students, that whilst they're homeschooling, they literally don't have the space within their accommodation to be able to learn effectively and finally about connectivity so access to wi-fi but also the reliability of that when there might be a large number of individuals join upon the same source we've taken a number of steps to begin to address this perhaps the most significant is that alongside the provision of ipads we'd also provided students with a uh, hundred pound annual credit which initially was towards texts we changed this scheme we expanded it so that they could also purchase mobile data if they needed to and it's been fascinating to understand why students were purchasing data in some cases it's for the obvious that they don't have broadband or they don't have reliable broadband but we also found students who were key workers who needed to learn on the move to their work and backwards and therefore needed access to it. We also had students, particularly international students, who wanted to keep in touch with their families during the pandemic. We haven't fixed this problem, it's a national problem and it impacts every element of the educational sector and I think we need to work more closely as educators with policy makers to make sure the right decisions are made to address this not just during the pandemic but over the years and decades to come as well. Yeah, from a I'll just I'll come in on from a technology standpoint here as well Ashton so the um, accessibility is is obviously the first thing that that we look at as a as a tech vendor so um, you know we recognize that not every student has access to the same um, device some have older devices working on older operating systems and so the the you know the fact that um, or technology needs to be mobile responsive. It needs to be accessed via a web browser, whether that's from an older device or a newer device, supporting um, you know, 
apps don't give you the same flexibility where that where that is concerned. The other thing that we try to focus on where we can is offline access. We recognize that not everybody has access to the internet. And so the capabilities within, particularly within LMS technology, where the students go to get their content and learn, the ability to take that content offline is, is something that we see as very, very important and something that, that, that we enable today. But I do agree with what Jonathan says. I think we've a responsibility to work with government to to try and improve in, in this area, you know, in, in South Africa, for example, you know, we have the government introduced the zero rating policy where educational websites, they worked with the telco companies to make sure that educational websites were actually free to, free, free to access and weren't actually using mobile data um, for their students. And, and certainly, you know, we, we encourage our customers in South Africa to, to make sure the Brightspace site that they're using is registered as zero rated as well. So a number of things that, that we focus on and, and a number of things that I think we, we can continue to focus on to improve in that area. Another question we've had, uh, we've spoken a lot today about teaching, learning and extracurricular activities. Um, but in terms of research, how is that going to look for the university of the future? The current pressure is meant, so it'd be interesting to think, you know, wh whether we think this extrapolates or not. The current pressure, again, has been practice based. So, so, so many people are able to continue to engage where they have time. Uh, you know, and and space uh, in the, in their research, um, if they're, if they're not in a campus en environment, I I think interestingly we've heard from a number of you know colleagues, um, both in our university and others about actually how engagement for um, conferences, webinars, uh, for example, we got three hundred we 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 had over four hundred. We're still we're still running at quite a high number. Would have been really difficult to get people in the room you know, to, to, to have this conversation in those sorts of numbers. So, so I think in many ways, you know, we can, we can see actually engagement, you know, both for learning and teaching and for research uh, and, and for sharing thoughts around, around research in a, in a discipline can be actually incredibly strong. However, um, you know, I think there's, there's, there's definitely something around practice and practice-based learning, um, which, which is a challenge. Um, you know, in, in the current mode of operating, and that sort of means, it, you know, that, that needs to extrapolate to the future, and we need to, you know, recognize that in terms of research. And when I say that, I mean field work and all sorts, you know, and so on and so forth, as well as just lab type activity. There are lots of people that do a lot of field work and excellent research, you know, you know that, requires, that requires travel and requires being in, in either outside or inside spaces. There's participant research, which I think, you know, it can be more difficult. It's not clearly obvious that engagement is better. In fact, it seems to be worse from what we're seeing and colleagues are seeing in terms of targeted participant research, which, 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 can, which can be more difficult. Um, and so I think we just need to think about what can we see through this digital enabled sort of mode that we're in at the moment that works well and works less well. And again, going back to my earlier sort of comment, you know, even if we think we can mitigate, you know, negative impacts, and we can do that around parts of research or research methodologies, it doesn't necessarily mean that we should, because that, you know, would, would perhaps change some of those experiences and conclusions, you know, that we might draw through that research. So uh, I think some of the comments in the chat that I've seen as I skimmed through as well, you know, talk about how difficult it is to draw those hard and fast conclusions at this stage, which I agree with. I think there's plenty more learning about how we operate, but, um, but I have no doubt that it, we're never just going to go back to how it used to be. It's, it's, it's never going to be legacy model A as it was in the past. Again, I don't think in many respects. Could I just add briefly, uh, Ashen, um, I think the place of the university of the future um, is linked to the university as a source of truth. And knowledge exchange and research are the mechanisms by which we derive those new truths and facts. Um, and, and therefore, I, I suppose my, my, my closing mark on, on the question of research is not my, I'm not the head of research. And uh, uh, whilst I do research, uh, my main focus is on the student experience. But the importance of having an academic community that develop new knowledge 
and exchange that knowledge um, with, with industry, exchange it with each other. Uh, I, I think that it'll be even more important in the future as we see those other traditional sources of truths being eroded. We must make sure that uh, the universities don't become um, uh, untrusted in that domain. So maintaining that trust is really important. Thanks, Jason. I think on that quite poignant note, um, and we are also coming up to time, we will round off the discussion there. Um, I would really like to thank all of you for that discussion, for being here today. Um, the same to our audience um, for also turning up and, and sticking with us throughout. That was a really interesting discussion. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>